Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Julia McLeod, and I'm the Outreach Director for the Harpswell Heritage Land Trust. Um, and all this year, we've been offering webinars on the theme of stories of change. And this is going to be our last one for this year. Um, all the recordings of past webinars are on our website, so I welcome you to watch or listen to some of those. And I think this is a great one to end on. We have Hannah Weber, who is going to talk to us about rockweed. Um, and during the webinar, um, you may have questions that come up and you can feel free to type them in the chat when you think of them. Um, but I'm not gonna ask Canada to answer them right during our talk, but I will come on at the end and I'll ask the questions that we've amassed in the chat. So um, we can't see or hear you in this webinar, but feel free to type into the chat and we can hear what you're thinking and what you're wondering about. So without further ado, I'll just pass it over to Hannah. Thanks so much for being here. Awesome. Thanks, Julia. It's great to be here. And let's see if I can start sharing my screen. Let's see if we can get this all going. All right, I think we did it. Cool. Um, so yes, thanks again, Julia, for the introduction. And I'm glad to be um, presenting the last of, of these um, Stories of Change webinars. So thanks for um, inviting me to give this talk on, on Rockweed. And I'm happy to be speaking with people who are associated with the Harpswell Heritage Land Trust, so thanks. Again, I'm Hannah Weber. I'm the Marine Ecology Program Director at Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park. Skudik Institute is a national, excuse me, is a nonprofit partner to the National Park Service with the mission of bringing together communities in science and learning for a changing world. I'm also a PhD candidate in ecology and environmental science program at the University of Maine. I'm in the CRASH group, which is the Conserving Rockweed Ecosystems for Sustainable Harvest or CRASH group. I study rockweed ecology for my PhD research and also for part of my work at Skudik. So how does someone uh, get curious about rockweed ecology and enough so to um, pursue it? Looks like I have auto advance on and that's gonna be really exciting. Um, I'm gonna go back and we'll get to that slide in a second. Um, but anyway, so uh, you know, how does somebody get curious enough to, to pursue this as a research career? Um, well, this person spends a lot of time in the intertidal zone in Maine. Um, First, as a kid with my siblings and cousins growing up in Casco Bay, um, and then with fellow naturalists um, when I was older, and fellow researchers now. So my siblings and cousins and I used to make wigs out of rockweed and dance around with them, and it's, it's honestly only a hop, skip, and a jump from, from making wigs um, to a curiosity that can only be answered with research. So in this talk, we will cover rockweed biology and ecology rockweed human uses and harvest, which is I think probably why many of you are here tonight. And then the research that I've been involved with here in Harpswell and along the coast of Maine. So we will um, step into rockweed biology and we will uh, meet this intertidal algae. So rockweed or Ascophyllum nidosum is a brown alga and it's found attached to rocks in the mid intertidal zone. So not too far up in the intertidal. This auto advance is gonna really become annoying and I don't know how to fix it. So we'll just be going back and forth and I will apologize now. So here we are, rockweed is in the mid intertidal, not too high up, not too far down. It's a long and slender olive green alga growing up to two meters tall, although the average height here in Maine is between um, 60 and 80 centimeters. Uh, an individual rockweed is made up of many fronds, all growing from a single holdfast. The fronds have air bladders or those bubbles that you can see. The holdfast is a disc of glue, basically, which is how rockweed is attached to rock. And rockweed, like the name implies, glues itself to rock. So you will not find it growing in mud or sand unless it happens to be glued to a rock that's covered by a layer of mud or sand. Rockweed is flexible and as seen in the previous slides, it floats up in the water 
when the tide comes in by means of these air bladders or vesicles that grow along the fronds. Rockweed is commonly found with another brown alga and they can get confused. The other brown is Fucus vesiculosus. You can tell them apart. We have Fucus on the right here and rockweed on the left. Guys, um, Julia, if you wanna jump in and you know anything about how to stop um, automatic advancing, let me know. Otherwise, I'm just gonna to have to keep going back folks uh, so that I can control the speed of this. Anyway. Sorry, um, I don't know off the top of my head how to do that. I don't either. So I apologize folks. Um, it's just gonna keep advancing on us and I'll just keep going back. Anyway, fucus has these wider fronds. It also has this raised sort of rib or midrib running down the middle of the fronds and often has paired air bladders, whereas rockweed just has the singular air bladders. So we find rockweed in the intertidal zone around the North Atlantic from Portugal up to the White Sea, over and across Iceland and Greenland, and then on the North American continent as far south as sort of New York, New Jersey, sort of the Long Island Sound. And through its range, it goes by different names, egg rack, knotted rack, wig rack, go figure, um, sea lock, egg rack, um, Norwegian kelp, among other names. Rockweed grows like other brown algae at the tips, circled here on the left with the, the red circles. So it'll elongate at the tips and each year along each frond, an individual will grow one air bladder. Um, marked here on the right with the one, two, three. Um, so you can count the air bladders along one frond, which will tell you the youngest possible age of that particular rockweed. And I say the youngest possible age um, because it's not, it's, it's, it's not possible to accurately age um, how old rockweeds are in the intertidal. Um, they get thrashed by storms and have a lot of their growth plucked off by ice. So ice and storms take the newer growth at the tips and then rockweed will start regrowing from whatever tips the storms or ice left behind. So it's impossible to tell how old rockweed is. We can only tell that it is no younger than the number of air bladders we find along one frond. And most air bladders we've found, um, the most we've found on an individual here in Maine was 18. So we know that that individual was no younger than 18. How old could rockweed get? This is gonna be fun. Now we're gonna go backwards too. How old could rockweed get? No one is really sure, but the general consensus is that holdfasts can persist for several decades up to the low hundreds of years with fronds regenerating from the holdfast. So um, let's talk about the reproductive cycle. If we went down to the shore today, you would probably find rockweed that has these sort of small flat paddles along the edge of the fronds. And this is the start of its reproductive cycle. Inside these flat paddles are the start of rockweed eggs and sperm. Yes, rockweed has different sexes, it's dioecious. You can have a male rockweed individual and a female rockweed individual. The reproductive cycle of rockweed is like this. Through the winter, the eggs and sperm will form in these receptacles. When the water temperature in the springtime gets to about six degrees C or um, 43 degrees Fahrenheit, the eggs and sperm will ripen and then be released into the water. Um, there are some who say that release of gametes is triggered by the combination of the right water temperature and the exposure of um, ripe receptacles to air overnight, so an overnight low tide. Um, you can actually see when rockweed are releasing as the receptacles become dotted, and there's also a change in color relative to the fronds. So female receptacles get these um, visible openings that eggs are released from, and males have these orange raised dots in their orange because the sperm are loaded with beta carotene. And I was actually at the Schilling Center once and there was this murky plume of eggs releasing from the rockweed near the dock. You can actually see eggs being released. Um, so once the, here we go, back and forth. So once the, the eggs and sperm are released, um, you know, we have this external fertilization and the fertilized eggs land on rocks and attempt to glue themselves down and start growing. 
And I say attempt because um, these algae are actually really bad at settling and growing. There's loads of eggs and there's more than enough sperm and the eggs release a sperm attractant. And so there's a hundred percent fertilization. Um, but the thing is, is that, you know, fertilized eggs get swept off the rocks and things eat the eggs. And so the, the juggernaut of getting to be a grown up rock weed is not getting swept off rocks and not getting eaten. And very few individuals make it past that. Um, if you've settled as a rock weed, a year later, 99.9% .9 of you are gonna be gone, eaten. Um, so that's, that's just the nature of the beast. There's, there's not a lot that make it past this juggernaut. Um, however, once it's attached and has grown large enough so that it started to produce fluorotannins as um, an anti-herbivory defense, it'll keep growing. As a quick little note before we do go on, adding to that complication about trying to figure out the age, that first air bladder might take two to five years to form, just as an added complication. Rockweed at first is a slow grower. During the first year, it grows maybe a half a centimeter. And in the second year, it grows maybe one and a half centimeters. After that, depending on where it's growing, it'll grow on average four inches or 10 centimeters per year. That's the average that we've found here throughout the entire coast of Maine. And as it grows, it branches. So growth is up and through branching is out. And so it'll branch and grow and branch and grow and branch and grow. We don't know exactly how old rock wheat can get, but it has invested in a long life set of strategies, starting with those um, fluorotannins or the anti-herbivory defense, as well as regrowth after damage. And unlike other seaweeds, rockweed also sheds its outer layer of cells continuously. This is gonna go very fast. Um, so it sheds its outer layer of cells and so it will not become encrusted with fouling organisms. So on the right-hand side, we can see this fucus is covered with spiral tube worms, but you will find few to none on rockweed. That's not to say you won't find things growing on rockweed, but it will be far less likely than on other seaweeds. So that's rockweed as an individual, and now we can look at it from an ecological perspective. Of course, first a word about where we find it, the intertidal zone. The intertidal is a tough place to call home. It's, it's one of the toughest environments on earth, simply because it's incredibly variable. Um, so anything that's living here is going to be exposed to nutrient availability limitations and changes in light, changes in temperature, changes in the amount of water um, drying out. And then there'll be you know, mechanical stresses and it's just plain unpredictable. So right, there's always gonna be the submerged subtitle. There's always gonna be the exposed land. And then there's the in-between with these stresses. Of course, the organisms that are existing here, they're adapted to this stressful and changing environment. They're adapted to the tide coming in and going out. Anything living in the intertidal zone is gonna get hot, gonna get cold, gonna get dry, gonna get wet, be in the water, be out of the water. This is where rockweed persists. And where it persists, it actually creates a habitat in the rocky intertidal. And so what do I mean by that? Um, so when the tide goes out, the organisms that are living in the inner tidal are exposed to this incredible heat in the summer, just out there on the rocks, and intense cold in the winter relative to the ocean. So on the left-hand side of this slide, there's a, a thermograph of a rocky inner tidal site in Nahant in Massachusetts. Note that to the right of that, it shows a picture of where this thermograph came from. It's all rock. Um, so there are some extreme heats and some of them are sort of tamped by you know, the creation of, of microclimates with little cracks and nooks and crannies in the rock. Um, but when the tide goes out, where there is rockweed, the rockweed drapes over the rocks and provides a refuge from extreme heat and wind. Ooh, there is wind. And so whether it's hot or cold, wind and these extreme temperatures means drying out. And of course, if you're an ocean creature, drying out is, is death. Um, 
Rockweed itself can lose about 70% of its water content and still function. This is a comparison for humans. Um, death occurs when we lose between 15 and 25% of our body water, just as a comparison. So going back to rockweed, rockweed can withstand these temperatures and wind fluctuations and live. And for all of the organisms underneath the blanket of rockweed, the environment stays more constant, especially in the summer. So as an example, um, you can see on the left-hand side, there's this little temperature and light sensor um, that we've put out around Frenchman Bay. And um, for the research I'll be talking about in a few minutes, we actually have these out throughout the state of Maine. Um, so we put out these little temperature and light sensors in rockweed around Frenchman Bay and at sites that were just on the rock next to sensors in the rockweed. Um, the data that I'm going to talk you through is, is low temperature, uh, low tide temperatures um, from 36 sites. And the, the data come from between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. and only on days when low tide was also between 10 a.m. And, and 2 p.m. And so we can see that we have these, these data from under rockweed and on bare rock from spring and summer and fall and winter. And we can um, see that in the spring and in the summer, under rockweed stays cooler than just out on the bare rock. We don't see as much of a difference in the fall. That's the third panel over. And we see really basically no difference. Actually, under rockweed is a little bit colder in the winter based on these temperature sensors um, than just out on bare rock. So we can see that at low tide, rockweed plays this environmental regulation role, especially in the summer. Um, at high tide, rockweed stops being a, a blanket and it floats up into the water and with those air bladders sort of buoying the rockweed individuals. And this creates this complex habitat for animals that crawl on the rocks and the gravel below and crawl on the rockweed itself and swim in the rockweed and float above the rockweed, um, eating and, and getting eaten or hiding. Um, at high tide, rockweed really creates this complex background against which the ecological game of eat and get eaten plays out. And this is just a quick little video that um, we'll play. And I'm gonna stop it about halfway through. So again, we have this, this complex habitat that's sort of keeping things nice and dark. I'll give five cents for anybody who can tell me what kind of fish it is that swims out in a second. We'll keep going. I don't know if you saw the, the fish. Um, so again, rockweed itself is a bit of a, a background player in this dance. As mentioned before, once it reaches a certain size, it's not terribly edible. Litterina obtusata, the smooth or flat periwinkle, will graze on rockweed, but the grazing itself induces that chemical defense that the fluorotannins get upregulated by the rockweed. And the role of this herbivory is either hotly debated by people who debate these things or is considered very minimal. Having said that, if you just look at this, the flat fronds of rockweed, rockweed actually ends up being something of a serving tray of, of biofilm of, of um, bacteria and, and diatoms. And that is quite tasty. So if you just imagine sort of a coating of biofilm over all of these flat fronds, that's largely what common periwinkle, pardon me, common periwinkle, Litterina litteria, are, are eating when they're seen on rockweed. Common periwinkles are completely turned off by the chemical defenses of rockweed and they don't eat it. All of this to say, you know, intact rockweed does not play a big role directly in the intertidal food web. Its big food web role is through detritus. Remember, it sheds its, its outer layer, its epidermis constantly. 
and it releases egg and sperm that get eaten up and break down if they don't get eaten up. And then there are storms and ice ripping off fronds. It all breaks down and serves a detrital food web. Rockweed fronds wash up in rack and float out to sea in rafts. Both ways host loads of organisms eating and getting eaten. And all the while the fronds are getting broken down and as is all this left skin. So again, rockweed's contribution to the food web is through detritus. Important to just know that that's its ecological role, sort of it's playing this, this foundation species and it's breaking down and feeding things through detritus. So we've talked about the rockweed's distribution and its life history and its ecology, and now we can switch gears and talk about how people have used rockweed through history, including um, in the here and now. Um, this is from my friends at Maine Coast Sea Veggies. It's their, their kelp with cayenne, which is very good. Um, and the kelp in this instance is Ascophyllum nidosum or rockweed. So this came uh, across my desk a couple of weeks ago. It's an article on the use of rockweed extract foliar spray on sweet pepper plants. Pardon me. Don't worry, we'll get it all worked out. Um, and, and the foliar spray is used in an area where synthetic fertilizers should be discouraged. Um, the upshot is that the peppers grew better, produced more peppers, and the homeowners did not need to use as much water on their pepper plants. This is one of the reasons why people harvest rockweed. It's used in agriculture to condition soil, to stimulate growth, to eliminate the use of synthetic fertilizers, and to cut down on the amount of water that farmers use on their crops. And we can see this use um, throughout history in print reference from the 1860s here in Maine. Um, that might be a little blurry. It says nothing but old, thoroughly um, rotten manure as free from seeds as compost made from rockweed should be applied. So we've been using this as a, on, on, for agricultural purposes for a very long time. We see this reference um, from fishing records and from other old newspaper articles. How would you like to be a seaweed gatherer from 1907? Not just here in Maine, but throughout its range. And we've seen it used on gardens and crops throughout history. Just as this fellow is about to put some soil conditioner on his garden. This is why um, there are harvesters out there now. One of the reasons why. Rockweed is considered a biostimulant, which is, in the eyes of the EPA, substances with the ability to enhance agricultural productivity through the stimulation of natural plant processes using substances and microbes already present in the environment. Plant biostimulants can also reduce the use of synthetic chemical fertilizers, as we've already mentioned, um, which of course makes it attractive as an option for sustainable agriculture and integrated pest management. Um, so increases plant growth and vigor and yield and production, improves soil health, optimizes nutrient use, and increases um, water efficiency. And here are some sheep grazing on seaweed and, and why. Rockweed increases the vigor of animals just as with plants. Rockweed has been used as an animal feed and as an additive to animal feed for as long as it's been used on crops. You can read about this here in Maine in Susan Shetterly's book, The Seaweed Chronicles, chapter three. Uh, so today, extracts from rockweed are used in nutraceutical applications, including supplements for animals and people. Historically, rockweed was burned to produce soda ash, key in the production of soap and bleached fabric and paper, and most important, glass. This was very labor intensive and driven by the times at which it happened and by industrialization. The use of, of calcium carbonate char from um, burning rockweed for soda ash didn't last long, but it was a crop for those living um, along the coast where it was growing. Today, rockweed is not used for soda ash, but today, in addition to use on crops and in animal feed, extracts are used for alginates or for thickeners. 
So rockweed is used for human and animal use in industrial use as a thickener on crops to cut down, pardon me, on the use of synthetic fertilizers and decrease water use on crops. Moving right along, as you know that we will. Um, so rockweed is harvested in the state of Maine as it has been in the past. Um, we have a quote here on the left, Luther Maddox was drying rockweed using a, a wood-fired rotary drum dryer in Southport in the 1860s, and he was making a soil conditioner and sending it to tobacco farmers in Connecticut. Um, today, there are about 100, there are about 100 licensed harvesters. Harvesters are required to leave a minimum of 16 inches of rockweed above the holdfast, that's about 41 centimeters. And they're required to report their monthly harvest to DMR, Department of Marine Resources. On the left here, we have a summary of rockweed harvest in Maine from the early 1960s to 2020. Obviously, as you can see, landings have gone up. This is all seaweeds, but rockweed is considered to be over 90% of those landings. Just a quick note about that 16 inch cutting minimum. The regulation in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick is um, a 12, little under 13 centimeter um, above the whole fast minimum, that's five inches. And in France, there is a, a 20 centimeter or eight inch or up to 30 centimeter, 12 inch minimum. So the main cutting minimum regulation is the most conservative cutting height known amongst the country, countries where rockweed is harvested. So once harvested, rockweed grows back just as it would after storms and ice. It's not harvested again until the biomass, the, the weight of rockweed, pardon me, in a particular area until that, that weight has, has come back to where it was before. And that's good management, right? Harvesters do not keep cutting and cutting and cutting in the same area until there's nothing left. Obviously solely relying on that one metric, the rockweed has grown back is not enough. In a world where we know that everything is connected, we need to think a little bit more about how to manage a natural resource, not just for its standing stock, but also in consideration of all the other organisms that rely on it. And this is certainly the case for rockweed that's not just a harvested commodity that people use to grow things better, but also because it's a habitat. And so we've talked about rockweed distribution and its life history and its ecology and its human use. And now we can talk about um, some of the research happening here in Harpswell and elsewhere in the state of Maine. Um, so we have a couple of sort of overarching um, research questions. Uh, so the, the couple of overarching research questions, how does rockweed harvest change the function of rockweed as a habitat? That's the work that I'm doing with the crash team. And I'm also part of a group that's using advanced technology to ask a super basic question, how much rockweed is there in the state of Maine? We need to answer these types of questions for 21st century research, resource management. And so starting with the how much rockweed is there in the state of Maine, I'll spend a little bit of time on both projects. We really don't know how much rockweed there is in the state of Maine to, to be straight up. And to misapply a business quote, it's hard to manage what isn't measured. Regardless of who's doing the managing, whether they're doing a loan or collectively, a landowner, harvester, resource manager, conservation organization, researcher, all working together, all working separately. If we don't know how much we, we have, it's, it's hard to manage. If you were to do a, a wild back of the envelope calculation using sort of miles of Maine coastline and throwing in some estimates, we get these wildly disparate um, at amounts of, of rockweed that we could potentially have along the coast of Maine. Um, the, the bottom line, the punch line is down at the bottom. Either we have 138,212,201 pounds with one estimate, or we might have as much as 3 billion 494,794,236 pounds. Um, it's really hard to know how much rockweed there is along the coast. 
these table two, by the way, is from the um, Department of Marine Resources Fisheries Management Plan. You can look these numbers up. So currently, the best way to get at where rockweed is, is to use satellite images or images of the coast shot from planes. The drawbacks being, um, if the tide is in, it's hard to know where the rockweed is or even the extent of the inner tidal. There can be clouds. And it's actually difficult to distinguish between rockweed and that evolutionary cousin, Fucus fasciculosus. And just knowing where something is doesn't tell us about how much is there, as we can't get at the volume or the biomass simply looking at the aerial extent. So the solution is to develop a tool that can cover, cover um, large areas of the coast, can distinguish between rockweed and Fucus fasciculosus, and estimate biomass. Again, not just the aerial extent, but the actual weight. So the partners that we are working with on this particular effort are Maine Maritime Academy, Nearview LLC, and Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences. And together we're developing a drone-based tool that can read the light bouncing off of rockweed, distinguish that light from the light of fucus, and then correlate differences in light with biomass or how much is there. We worked in Harpswell last summer um, as part of developing this tool and the work continues as we narrow in on how biomass changes the light signature in the field and in the lab. I should mention that there is another way to get at how much there is and that's to weigh rockweed in the field all over the state. Maine has a very long coastline and that's hard. Not impossible and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, but here's a, a video of drone footage. Um, it was a prep drone flight that Nearview conducted in Harpswell in the spring of 2020. Um, and at about 20 seconds in, there will be a quick jag in the video. So if you get seasick, you've been forewarned. I know that Harpswell has a long, a long coastline, so uh, you, you can put in the chat if you want to where that is, but um, where in Harpswell it is, but that was Harpswell. And then, so that was, you know, trying to figure out how much rockweed there is along the coast of Maine, shifting research gears to that first question I posed, you know, how does rockweed harvest change the functions of rockweed as a habitat? Um, these questions, that question has been known for quite, you know, we, we need to get at the bottom of this. And that's been known for quite some time. And it was certainly highlighted in the 2014 um, fisheries management plan as key needs for future research. Um, first, how does structural change from, from harvest benefit or detract from the habitat? And then how does architecture of rockweed affect associated species? So again, the, the crash, um, team that's conserving rockweed animal systems for sustainable harvest is, is researching the relationship between rockweed harvest and food webs. So we're looking at the habitat itself, the prey species, and of course, um, we're looking at bird predators. So the, the, the research objectives, you know, characterizing these ecosystem linkages between biomass and architecture the abiotic environment, going back to that temperature and, and adding in light and wave action, also the invertebrate assemblages and then coastal birds, and then assessing the potential for harvest to influence this ecosystem. In 2018, we selected 45 sites along the coast of Maine, pardon me, that have harvest quality and quantity of rockweed. Half of the sites were harvested um, and the other half were not. We worked with harvest partners and coastal landowners to do this work. And we really couldn't do it without either partner. And I'm very grateful for both. So some of our, our partners in this work and our funders in this effort, of course, the research team um, listed there on the left. 
So we collected, so a, a study site or a study area, you know, we harvested, pardon me, commercial size sites. So hundred meters of, of shoreline and then tried to, and then kept a minimum of 100 meters between our sites. So we collected um, data from the sites before they were harvested um, and then collected data after they were harvested sometimes just after, in some cases a year after, in some cases 18 months, and some sites will be sampled again this fall, two years after harvest. So um, we've collected data on, on changes to the habitat, again, temperature and light, invertebrates that form the basis of the food chain, and then the bird populations that are found in the rock region. Here's what we found to date. There will be graphs on the next several, I'll try to go through them um, slowly and carefully. So, um, and all of these results are preliminary. They are not final. That's important to note. Um, so how does harvest impact just the rockweed that's here? And we're just measuring biomass, just the weight, how much is there? Um, the gray symbols are from the control sites and the blue symbols are from the impacted sites or harvested sites. So a year before harvest, we have a little bit more um, rockweed in our impact sites. Immediately after, we have more um, biomass in our control sites. There's absolutely no change in the biomass from our impact sites. And then a year after, we actually have acquired more biomass in those impact sites than in the control sites. So there's been greater rockweed growth in the impact sites. So in, switching over to some of these abiotic effects. So the, we've got sort of these sensors out, as you can see on the left-hand side, we've got these small sensors out throughout um, the coast of Maine. Um, and the graph, we are looking at temperature beneath rockweed canopy. And we're looking at the midday low tides and the vertical lines that you see are standard deviation. These data are very noisy. Um, the blue line is the harvest sites and the red line is the control sites. Down on the x-axis, we have the month and the year and we've sort of shaded in when harvest occurred. And then on the y-axis, we have temperature. So you can see that there's, um, there's not really much of an effect on that temperature moderation that we saw in, in Frenchman Bay. Turning to light, because these sensors measure temperature and light, turning to light, we seem to see that harvest has a short-term effect on understory light. So again, the blue line is the harvest sites, the red line is the control sites. These vertical lines that you see are the standard deviation. There's lots of noise in these data. Um, and we can see that there's a, a change Basically, in the spring of 2020, the spring after harvest, we see that there is an increase in light in our harvest sites relative to our control sites, but that um, effect does not seem to last. So we've got a, a difference through like June of 2020, and then we don't seem to have um, that change being sustained. Here is um, difference in invertebrates. I have just skipped over an entire slide. So let's just quickly touch on that. Um, so the types of invertebrates, again, these are preliminary results. Um, the types of invertebrates that we're seeing are largely isopods and gastropods, so snails. Um, we've identified and counted around 29,000 individual invertebrates. Definitely there are some regional differences in the average invertebrates that we're seeing. We've seen over 70 species of invertebrate. Um, not all invertebrates are found in each location. Um, we are seeing a slight increase in abundance at control sites. And then the impact sites sort of have this similar abundance following harvest. So again, the, the gray here are the control sites and the blue are the impact sites. Notice that this is just one year before and immediately after harvest. We don't have the data yet for one year after. We will have those data. We don't have them yet. So 
Um, we do see an increase in the control. We do not see that increase in the impact. It'll be interesting to see if this changes when we do process more data. Um, and we'll have to see if we see the same or different trends from the one year after harvest um, data. Here are our birds. Here's what we're seeing for birds before and after harvest. Again, we've got one year before and immediately after, and then one year after on the x-axis. And then um, on the y-axis, we have sort of this, this prediction of what we would see. And then we have the raw count, those, those filled circle, circles, those little bubbles down at the bottom. Um, a lot of zero counts, a lot of times of going out and doing surveys and not seeing any birds. But there were times when we did obviously go out and see birds. Um, we see a decline in the birds from a year before to immediately after harvest in both sites. And then one year after harvest, we see more birds in the impact or harvest sites than we saw in the control sites. So takeaways, lots of words on this slide, and I'm never really a fan of that, but um, rockweed, you know, immediately after the harvest, there is of course a reduction in biomass. And then a year after harvest, um, there's an increase in biomass that was greater at the impact sites than the control sites. In terms of temperature and light, we do see an increase in light conditions, but that does not seem to be sustained through time. We don't see a change in the temperature um, at low tide underneath the rockweed. For invertebrates, we're still waiting on a lot of lab work. It takes work to identify these things. So we're just still waiting for that. And for the birds, a year after rockweed harvest, we are seeing higher bird counts at the impact sites relative to the control sites. So that's that work. The crash team is also studying how does architecture of rockweed affect associated species? And, and why do we care about architecture? Well, we, we care because um, once cut rockweed can grow back bushier. I would like to note that although um, this quote uses the word plant, rockweed is not a plant, it's an algae. It's an alga, it is not a plant. But um, suffice to say, it can grow back with a changed shape, a changed architecture relative to what it had before harvest. So to, to get around answering the question is how does um, architecture of rockweed affect associated species, um, we've gone out to areas of, of different known harvest histories, and we've gotten these histories from harvesters and also from landowners who wanted us to come and collect at their sites. So we've collected individual rockweeds. We collected these at high tide because, you know, that's when we assumed that there would be a, a difference in how architecture and invertebrates relate to each other. At the same sites, we also did collect um, samples at low tide as well, but really um, we're focused for this work on the high tide um, individuals. We removed all of the invertebrates from the collected individuals, um, collected different measures of architecture, and then um, we will relate the number and species of invertebrates to the architecture measures. Um, we're still analyzing those data. So we've talked about the distribution and the life history, the ecology and the human use and some research. And I wanna wrap up here with a little bit about ways that you can get involved with rockweed research here in Harpswell. Um, we have two projects that engage anyone in the collection of data that help us better understand rockweed along the coast. So the first way, I remember a while ago in our talk and our time here together, I said that um, there was another way to get at how much rockweed there is. And that way involves weighing rockweed in the field all over the state. And we've started a citizen science effort to train and go out with people and send folks out to collect data on rockweed biomass where folks live and visit. Um, it's great to have a statewide estimate, but it's also good that people know how much rockweed is in their own backyards, as it were. So the project is called Project ASCO, Assessing Seaweed Through Community Observations. And we train folks and provide materials, help people find sites, to um, collect data from. And we also make the data available on the website anicdata.org for anyone to access. So again, why? We know that the coast is changing and how we use it is changing. There is a data gap. We don't know how much rockweed there is in the state of Maine. We all know that 
better data helps make better decisions. And it's actually a lot of fun to be out collecting data with lots of people. The other project you can get involved with is you can become a Signs of the Seasons Coastal Observer. Signs of the Seasons, pardon me, is a program that's run by the Humane Cooperative Extension, and it focuses on paying attention throughout the year to the different phenophases, the different reproductive phases of, of rockweed um, through the year. So you can sign up to become a coastal observer through Signs of the Seasons and go out and visit your same patch of rockweed over and over and over again to, to look for these phenophases and to see if they're changing with a changing climate. So in wrapping up, first, of course, I would like to say thank you for allowing me to go back and forth through the slide because obviously I did something with timing. Um, we've walked through the rockweed biology and ecology and human use and research, including how you can be involved. And of course, I want to thank Julia again for the invite, all of you for coming. And with that, I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Hannah. I wonder if you could maybe stop sharing your screen so we can see both of us a little bit easier. Yeah. Great. Um, so we have a few questions already in here. And then uh, for others who have questions that they'd like to ask, feel free to type them in the chat. There's still time for you to do that. Um, the first question that came in from Anne is, how does harvesting rockweed affect the seabed? Sure, so that's what we're trying to answer with our question. And so just to be clear, I'm talking about the, the bed underneath rockweed in the intertidal zone, so not way out in the ocean. And that's exactly what we're trying to answer with the research that we're conducting. Um, so watch this, watch this space. Yeah. Um, and then the next one from Robin. Um, so it's, it's a little long, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, the impact of harvest depends on the intensity of harvest. Um, and how did, so I think what this is getting at is how intensely harvested your study areas were. Is that what you get from reading that question? Sure. And the, I mean, the intensity was definitely highly variable, but, um, we definitely had some intensely harvested sites. And we definitely had some intensely harvested sites in Harpswell and in Down East Maine. We do have sites in Cobbs Cook Bay. Um, we have sites that were um, machine harvested. So um, we did, we, we have intensely harvested sites. Um, and, and it's, a, it's a great question, Robin, because um, there is definitely a lot of variability in how harvesters approach um, and how harvesters approach that 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 you know intensity and whether they're looking at a whole sector and taking 17% of a whole sector and spreading that over all of the beds that are accessible or if they're um, sort of focusing on one bed and taking the entire 17% of a sector from one bed. We've seen both. And definitely where a harvester is taking 17% of a sector from one bed, that bed is, is more severely harvested than if they're spreading 17% of the total biomass taken over an entire sector. So very definitely have variability in severity. Great. Um, there's a question about if harvesters actually keep to the 16 inch rule and who is in charge of making sure that they do. And I guess what I would add to that on top of what the person wrote is, how do they know if they're 16 inches? <laughs> Yeah, sure. And actually, um, not that I want to give um, the, the folks at source micronutrients like, um, you, you know, not that I want to say go go out on the water with them, but uh, but it, mechanical harvesters have this sort of bell that comes off a nozzle at the end of their boat. Uh, the cutting blade in that nozzle is reset. 16 to 18 inches above the edge of the bell. These are these are metal bells. These are not um, things that that are malleable or squishable at all. So the the cutting blade is 
inset 16 to 18 inches. Um, once the harvesters turn on sort of their, their sucking machinery, rockweed is sort of sort of floby, like is sucked into the bell and then the, the, the cutting blade spins and cuts. But that way they are assured that there is a 16 inch, um, you know, remainder. The same cannot be said for, for rake cutting, um, that's for sure. And I think that that's just a different, a different type of cutting. Um, who is in charge of making sure that they do? That's the role of Department of Marine Resources, but also, um, you know, if, if you're concerned, I would definitely go out and measure your own rockweed. Um, a question that I'm gonna add in here before I read another one that's on there is just how, how long are you gonna be looking at these sites, the control and the, and the harvest sites that you're looking at now? Sure, so um, largely we have, we wrapped up with looking at one year after harvest. Um, some of the work went to 18 months and then where some of these temperature and light loggers are, um, we'll go back this fall two years after harvest and take out the sensors and do one last round of, of biomass measuring. Um, so after this fall, we will be completely done with this work. Okay. And then um, sort of leading into the question that was typed in here is uh, Molly asks, would you say that your data so far suggests that harvesting may not be terribly harmful? And then there was someone else who was wondering if harvesting is, is actually beneficial. So I wonder if you can make those, if you can, I know that a lot of your data is preliminary and you may not be able to make that, that call, but um, people are curious. Yeah. About it is, and I would, I'm, I'm hesitating only because as you saw on the bottom of all those slides, it says preliminary data. And so I get a little uncertain about about really wanting to, to come out and say um, rockweed harvesting would be beneficial or not terribly harmful. Our data does suggest that, you know, and going to Robin's point, our data does suggest that with the intensity, the, the range of intensity that we've seen at our sites, um, we're not seeing big differences between our harvested and our unharvested sites. So, yeah, let's leave it at that. Okay. Um, is there anyone else out there who wants to type in a question? Um, I was a little curious just on those counts of 20 something thousand um, invertebrates. Do you have a lot of college students who help out or sort of how, how, do, you, how do you manage to count yeah. that many? How do you manage to collect right. all that data? So yes, so the crash team member who is in charge of that work is Hannah Middlestadt. She's a PhD student at the University of Maine. Um, and she has had an enormous cadre of undergraduates um, who she's trained and then who have um, counted and identified the invertebrates who have been in her samples. A lot of people, a lot of training, a lot of hands, yeah. Could be a summer, fun summer gig. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think that all of the students and all of the other people that we've engaged in this work um, have really enjoyed it and had a fun time either out in the field or, or in the lab. So um, it's been a good group of people. We've been very, very grateful for the work that they've done. Great. Um, all right. Well, actually, I'll ask one more question since we have a few more minutes. So you have one more chance to type your question in the chat, um, but I'll ask one question while we're waiting. And that's sort of, what's, do you, do you know what your next big question is gonna be that you're gonna investigate? Sure. Um, yeah, so we're doing, so there's a couple of things. Um, a couple of things. So one thing we really wanna know about is, is fish use of, of rockweed and how that might change with, with harvest. Uh, in Maine conditions, you know, in the, the harvest regime that we have here in the state of Maine. So that's one thing. We, we've become dreadfully curious with the rockweed that washes up on shore and the rockweed that washes out into the ocean. You know, what role is that playing in the upland ecosystem and in the um, ocean ecosystem? So um, those, are, those are areas of curiosity for sure. Um, yeah. 
Um, there's a couple more questions. It's a question of whether it's all right to take small amounts of already detached rockweed, as I know that a lot of people, including myself, have taken for gardens. Um, is that okay, or is that or is that important to leave on the beach for? No, other that's um, it, if you look through the the history of people taking rockweed and putting it on their gardens. Um, this is a long and rich history, people. It, it's all right. Um, the, it's, it's all right. You can take it. Um, uh, when you drive from Blue Hill down to Stonington, you go across this causeway. And um, if it's low tide and it's not freezing cold out, you will always see people collecting um, the rack um, right along that stretch. I would note that um, if you don't own the rockweed, if you do not own that area, you do need to get permission from the upland landowner to even um, collect rack that is considered uh, you know, of the soil and it belongs to the upland landowner. Okay. Um, and then there's a question about edible seaweeds and how you know what kind of seaweeds are edible and are, are most of them edible and they, people just don't eat them or, you know, I'm curious. curious yeah. about that. Don't bother eating rockweed. Although <laughs> when, it's, when it's dried and powdered, it tastes actually kind of like powdered pesto, you know, from a, from a, from a mix, it's really not that bad. But if you were just to go out there and munch it, you would be turned off immediately. Um, but some people do eat it. Uh, you can go on the Maine Seaweed Council or Maine Sea Grant website to find edible seaweeds here in the state of Maine um, and other places. There are many, many, many edible seaweeds here in the state of Maine um, and, and throughout the world. So definitely start investigating and go go check them out. You will find some that, that you like. I know you will. Great. And then I think I'll go with this as our last question. Um, and Adrian asked, is there collaborative research between your project and other projects? Um, he says, I'm thinking of the eiders and their chicks that forage in the rockweed and wondering um, if those populations are correlated. Sure. Um, so it's a great question. And the reason why we went down the road of having um, bird as our um, predators instead of fish is, is because people have been so concerned about bird use of, of the rockweed habitat. So this work has been correlated with, with other work looking at eiders specifically, but also looking at purple sandpipers, looking at shorebirds and waterbirds. Um, and it's interesting actually, um, there was a paper that came out in 2020 um, that correlated sort of where we see birds along the main coast with what kind of seaweed was most um, prevalent. And seabirds like eiders were correlated with fucus, that, that, that other seaweed, whereas shorebirds were more likely to be correlated and upland birds were more likely to be correlated with um, rockweed. So there, there are some relationships that are being developed, but it really we're seeing more eiders where we see more fucus and we're seeing more shorebirds or upland birds where we see more rockweed. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us and it was really interesting and I really appreciate you taking the time and I'm sure everyone on here is saying thank you too in their own little homes. <laughs> but yeah. thanks so much. And thanks thank everyone for joining up. us. Good night, everyone. Have a good one. Bye.